Well, 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 my friends, it happened again. This time it's being called the largest supply chain attack in history. And it all started out, as we'll see, with just a simple phishing email. But was it actually as impactful as it seems? Well, let's talk about all of that and more. First off, who are the major players here? Well, we have NPM. What is NPM? Well, NPM stands for Node Package Manager, and it's the largest package ecosystem for JavaScript developers. The general idea here is that we have this reusable code um, in components that can be shared across multiple projects. And in this case, it takes the form of NPM packages, which are managed by NPM. Now, I hate using analogies like this, but in this case, I think it'll actually help. Um, and this is where I'm getting this from. But think of it like a giant public library of Lego pieces. And each Lego piece is a small block of code, right? Maybe this piece here handles sending emails. Uh, this one over here can draw charts. Uh, maybe this one over here can handle connecting to specific databases or interact with an API. Now, developers don't wanna reinvent the wheel every time they build something. And so instead of carving each block by hand, well, they go to the Lego store or they go to this library uh, and pick out the pieces that they need or snap them together to build their own applications. If that description sounds a lot like dynamic link libraries or DLLs in the Windows world, that's because the concept is nearly the same. Well, the concept is. They're two very different components from each other. But conceptually, DLLs are also pre-written chunks of code that applications can call when they need certain functionality. In Windows, maybe that's opening a file or displaying a menu, handling network traffic in some way. Now, NPM is the system that organizes and stores and delivers these reusable JavaScript packages. And it makes it easy for developers to both share these Lego blocks that they've created and reuse ones that are built by others. Because so many applications rely on these packages, NPM sits right at the heart of the modern software development ecosystem. So then what is a supply chain attack? Well, in this context, it's where attackers compromise the trusted pipeline itself, right? The distribution network. In this case, the NPM account of a package maintainer. So that all of the downstream developers unknowingly receive and install malware or malicious code in the form of package updates. And the reason why this kind of thing can scale so destructively is that instead of targeting each end user or developer individually, the attacker poisons the well upstream, right? So anyone who pulls down updates from the compromised package is gonna inherit the attacker's code. Right, if an attacker injects malicious code into a package, well, every developer or company that installs that version of the package will inherit that malware. And that's why incidents like this are so critical, right? It's this sort of one-to-many impact. A single compromise maintainer can ripple out to thousands or millions of developers and organizations who depend on that package, right? The blast radius of a supply chain attack is enormous, and it leverages that trust in the entire ecosystem as its weapon. So what actually happened today? Well, a few hours ago, the developer, and I'm not gonna put him on blast here, so we'll go by handles, but he shared that his NPM account was compromised by a 2FA reset phishing email. If we move the conversation over to Hacker News, we get a little bit more context. And so in his own words, he received what looked like a legitimate security email. And he clicked through and unknowingly handed over the keys to, as we'll see, one of the most critical accounts in the NPM ecosystem. And so he admitted, uh, hi, yep, I got pwned. Sorry, everyone. Very embarrassing. And did a good job of listing the affected packages, right? So you can see just how many are listed here. And to put it into perspective, Aikido's research team has been really leading the reporting on this incident by tracking the affected packages and analyzing the malware in real time. In total, uh, 18 very popular NPM packages were compromised, right? And so we can see just the amount of downloads per week here. We have, uh, you know, ANSI styles at 371 million. We have chalk with 300 million, right? All of these. And altogether, these packages account for over 2 billion downloads per week. That's billions of instances where developers around the world could have pulled in malicious code without knowing it. And this is why it's sort of being classified as potentially the largest NPM supply chain compromise in history. Now, we'll talk about why uh, there might be some nuance there in a moment. And I gotta empathize here and also commend the developer for being so transparent, right? And being proactive by sharing updates publicly and trying to work with the community to mitigate the fallout as much as possible. Um, at the time of recording here, uh, and this is a very volatile and developing story, uh, but his NPM account has been completely unreachable, and so he has no recourse other than really waiting for NPM to respond here. But he did manage to take down a number of the malicious uh, package updates before he lost access. I mean, this comment really puts it best here, right? This could have been anyone. 
Um, in fact, by the looks of it, there have been multiple reports that other NPM maintainers and developers were targeted by the same phishing campaign as well. And so let's take a look at the fish itself, right? And so uh, here I have it pulled up. And according to his post, the compromise started out with this email that looked like it came from NPM support. And from the outset, it does a pretty convincing job here, right? We have the NPM logo. Uh, it looks like the branding and the email template is accurate. Uh, even the wording is quite good, right? Uh, and all of this is very well put together uh, as a phishing email. Uh, we can see it's using elements of urgency here, right? So accounts with outdated 2FA credentials will be temporarily locked starting September 10th, just two days from now. And so it's setting off that fuse, right? It's using these common social engineering techniques to prompt the victim to act and avoid repercussions. I mean, this is just textbook phishing, right? There's a reason why email phishing is still one of the top initial infection vectors in Mandiant's recent mTrends report, right? It just works uh, right up there with stolen credentials, which we'll get to in a moment. Now back to this phishing email. Did you notice anything off about it? Yeah, let's take a look at the sender here. We have npmjs.help as the email sending domain. Now, this is quite crafty by the attacker here, right? Because the legitimate NPM domain is npmjs.com. And so by registering this TLD swap here from .com to .help, it's a very subtle change, but that's all it takes in this scenario. And we typically call this type of attack, um, you know, sometimes typo squatting. Uh, specifically, again, it's a TLD or a top level domain swap. Most people who aren't paying too much attention uh, or are just preoccupied like our developer here uh, might just focus on the local part of the email, maybe the second level domain, right? Support at npmjs and might not notice that the top level domain itself has changed. And if you combine that with the urgent language that we see, you know, this campaign really used both technical manipulation like typo squatting and also just classic, you know, time and tested social engineering techniques to gain access. Now, if we take a look at when this npmjs.help domain was registered, um, we can see it was created on September 5th, just three days ago. And it was registered over at Porkbun, which is an email hosting and domain registrar. Now, I always say that a lot of these attacks are opportunistic, and this is kind of proof of that right here, right? Now, this wasn't some advanced persistent threat group burning a domain that they've built a reputation for, uh, you know, for a number of years. Uh, no, <laughs> this was registered last Friday. And so fortunately, the credential capture page itself is down now. Uh, but if I go to Wayback Machine, we can see what it actually looked like. Uh, and really, there's not much to look at here. Right? This is this is the NPM homepage. I mean, literally, uh, you know, if we put these two side by side. So here we have the fish and this is the you know original, the actual legitimate NPM homepage. It's basically identical. Right. And so this is really well done. Uh, now, sadly, the login page itself wasn't archived, so we can't see what that really look like, but I imagine it was something like this, right? The actual npmjs.com login page. But according to this researcher who was able to get their eyes on it before it went down, um, the login credentials, once they were submitted, uh, were exfiltrated over to this strange URL. So we can see websocket-api.publicvm.com, and then it's seemingly going to some weird, you know, slash images, slash JPEG to PNG.php. And then it's providing some URL parameters, which are giving us a little bit more uh, context here, right? And so if you've seen this base domain, publicvm.com before, uh, it's quite notorious for hosting a number of different types of malware, like Trojans or backdoors. In fact, if we look at this Malwarebytes uh, article here, or for instance, uh, here's an example of the VJWorm malware using publicvm.com uh, to host its command and control server. And obviously in this case, well, we can see that the attacker disguised their credential collection script as some kind of JPEG to PNG converter application. Uh, but instead of handling images, it simply took in the victim's email and password, as we can see from the different parameters here, and transmitted them straight over to the attacker. Now, you know, as we've learned, the developer's NPM account in this case was compromised using this method. But what did the attackers actually do with this access? According to research from Aikido Security, the threat actors pushed updated versions of all of those affected packages and quietly injected malware into the package's index.js files. And so scope-wise, obviously this is massive, right? But there are some silver linings in regards to what specifically, or I guess who, is being targeted here. For example, here's the package for Chalk, which is one of the largest NPM packages affected by this attack. And we can see that this package has 3 million weekly downloads. And all it is really is it just provides a wrapper for styling text in the terminal. Um, so you can choose different colors, you know, make things bold or underlined, uh, whatever. Anyways, 
if we take a look at the version history, we notice something unusual, right? So we see the 5.6.2 release was published a few hours ago, but the 5.6.1 release is missing entirely. Uh, that's because version 5.6.1 was the malicious update, the one where attackers injected their code. Now, according to the reports, I kind of hinted earlier, the maintainer realized what had happened and attempted to course correct to sort of contain the damage. And so before losing full access to his account, he managed to delete most of the compromised package versions, which is why version 5.6.1 no longer appears in the public registry. However, I got my hands on the malicious version of the index.js file from the chalk package. Uh, you know, all of the identified packages had the same kind of changes made to them. And so we could run a quick diff check to see what was actually injected into these packages. And when we do, we're gonna come across a really strange set of JavaScript. And so what we're looking at here is a common style of JavaScript string and array obfuscation that often is produced by tools like obfuscator.io. Now I wasted a lot of time trying to, uh, you know, manually go in and you know try to write custom JavaScript deobfuscators and uh, try to understand the array offset and whatnot. This really isn't my, uh, you know, uh, bread and butter here. But then I just realized I could use the obfuscator.io deobfuscator. Right? <laughs> There's a tool that we can use, and that's exactly what I did. And so it's not perfect, but what we get here is code that functions as a browser-based interceptor that's designed to hijack network traffic and intercept application API calls. More specifically, the malware itself fortunately appears to have a very narrow focus. It's primarily designed around cryptocurrency theft. And so that still obviously makes it dangerous, but it limits the scope of impact, right? It kind of keeps the blast radius smaller than it could have been, right? Now, this could have been a very nasty piece of uh, malware being run here, right? But instead, what we get is, well, I'm gonna steal your <laughs> your Ethereum, right? Or your uh, Solana coin, whatever. Um, uh, but let's try to understand what it's actually doing here. And again, we didn't get a perfect deobfuscation here, but we can sort of work our way down um, uh, the script here and see what's going on. And so first we have this check Ethereum W function, and it's checking if window.ethereum exists. And window.ethereum is a globally available JavaScript object, uh, kind of like a provider that Ethereum wallet browser extensions like MetaMask inject into a web page to serve as a bridge between uh, sort of the decentralized application and the user's wallet. And so I, I know little to nothing about Web3 and you know crypto wallets and whatnot. So I've always found this a little bit janky, but it allows web applications to detect the presence of a wallet. And it can do things like requesting user accounts, uh, it can handle sort of the transactions to the blockchain by providing access to the Ethereum provider API. And so with that, it's checking to see if that exists and it's set to anything. And it's requesting a list of Ethereum accounts. So we can see ETH underscore accounts here. It also seems to do a similar thing to detect APIs used by Solana. And so again, at a high level, the malicious code that was added to this package is kind of sitting at a low level, trying to hook itself into the user's browser environment. And it's trying to intercept the user's web traffic and specifically their crypto wallet activity. And as we dig into it more, we'll find that it's set up to actively monitor for sensitive data going over the network, as well as transaction payloads for wallet addresses or cryptocurrency transfers between different ecosystems like Ethereum or Bitcoin or Solana or Tron or Litecoin or Bitcoin Cash. And so we can see all these different arrays of cryptocurrency addresses, right? And so we can see a list of Bitcoin addresses starting with BC1 here. Uh, we can see a list of Ethereum addresses starting with OX. And in the context of this malicious injected code hooking into the browser, these arrays are almost certainly attacker controlled wallets. Right? And so the malware likely uses these to replace legitimate transaction destinations in the browser before the user signs the transaction. And so essentially, whenever the malware or the hook detects a crypto transaction in the browser, it can dynamically swap the recipient with one of the attacker-controlled wallets so that the attacker ultimately receives the funds. In this snippet, we can see a little bit more of how the code actually hooks into um, uh, some of those network requests, right? And so in this case, it's intercepting all of the requests made with fetch. And so it's taking over that sort of a global reference to fetch and is able to inject its own code to inspect or potentially modifies the data, right? To steal or redirect the crypto transactions and then return a response that appears legitimate to the user or the application. So let's take a, a very simple dynamic look at what's going on here. And so what I've done is create a sample sandbox HTML file. Let me just open it up. 
Uh, that all it does is just import the malicious index.js uh, that's included in the package, right? Or that was. Um, and so what I'll do here is open it up in Firefox. And again, we just have a blank page here that's just including that index.js script. And if I were to open up the console window here, what I can do to demonstrate this is just very simply run the fetch method, right? And so let me just type in fetch here. And we can see that instead of calling the real fetch method, what we've done here is call or reference an asynchronous function called fetch with the same name that's overriding the global fetch function. And so that's what it looks like when we've sort of been uh, compromised here, right? So the, the malicious fetch function has been sort of hooked into the browser uh, on this specific site because we're calling in that index.js page. If I were to go to any other site here and do the same thing, right? Let me just go into the console, zoom in here and just call fetch. Well, we can see it's actually calling the real fetch function, right? If I go back to crypto bro here, uh, where we actually are calling this, uh, you know, uh, overridden function, we can jump to the definition here which in fact, it's gonna point us over to index.js, which was loaded in with this web page, right? And so uh, very strange behavior here. Obviously, a lot of nefarious things can be done when a global method like fetch can be overridden, uh, specifically to uh, intercept web requests and make modifications before showing them to the user, kind of like a rootkit, but in the browser. Now, what's the remediation here? Or how can we check if we've been sort of compromised and downloaded one of these malicious packages uh, in one of our projects, right? Well, the quick and dirty way, there's a few different ways, you know, we could sort of in theory do this kind of thing. Uh, but assuming we're in a project directory, if we have our node modules folder, again, this is sort of a, a simulated here, but what we can do is just run a simple grep here to check for one of those strings. For example, in the malicious injected code, we saw references to a function that was defined called check Ethereum W. And so I can run grep recursively here uh, and just print out the files that match that string. So in this case, if we're getting a match here, that's not a good sign, right? We don't want to have uh, that malicious string or that uh, indicator of attack inside of our index.js file, right? So very, again, simple, quick and dirty way to find that kind of thing. Uh, there are also a few different scripts that we can use for this purpose. This script will check our NPM cache to find if any of those affected packages, uh, specifically those versions were pulled into our machine and it'll give us a nice little printout if we have any matches. And so again, a uh, nicely put together script there. But honestly, you know, the takeaway is the same. It's always been audit your dependencies, right? And specifically, if you're not in the sort of crypto web three world and you weren't using or actively maintaining one of those packages in your projects, there's probably not much you have to worry about here, right? Again, it is a supply chain attack uh, in theory, <laughs> the biggest in history, just due to the sheer amount of downloads that these packages have. But the attack itself was just so narrow and specific, right? So uh, it, it is one of those weird cases, but uh, according to this article here, the attackers only made like five cents. And so, I don't know, um, scope wise, this could have been disastrous, right? But I think, uh, fortunately, it, it turned out to be kind of a something burger, right? Not quite a nothing burger, but, um, you know, maybe not a, a Big Mac or something. I don't know. It's sort of in between. Uh, it could have been worse, right? And so we'll see how the story develops. Again, it's still kind of early. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to post this. I'm going to try to get it out as soon as possible. But, uh, you know, things could change by the time that this video goes out and it could be completely out of date. And this could be uh, the, the next log for Jay or something, right? So we'll see. But I just wanted to make a quick recap of what I know is going on. If you're like me and came across a bunch of uh, doom scrolling articles today about how the internet is back on fire uh, due to this incident. But uh, fortunately, I think everything is going to be okay.